you can heat your home and get paid in Bitcoin to do it. Today we're going to be taking a look at making your own space heater out of a used low cost Bitcoin miner, one that can be held in a nice looking wipe approved 3D printed case. I am Ben with the BTC Sessions and this is your daily session. Bitcoin. Before we dive in, shout out to sponsors of the show, hodlhodl.com. If you're looking to buy Bitcoin and you have a few priorities in mind, like peer-to-peer -peer trading, instant self-custody, and no KYC, meaning you don't have to give up any personal information, then HODL HODL can be for you. You can head over there, you can sign up with nothing more than an email address and be getting non-KYC Bitcoin in no time at all. All. It's super easy. Their dashboard takes seconds to search and create offers. And they also have a lending platform in which nothing is ever rehypothecated. You can check them out at hodlhodl.com. There's a link down below in the show notes if you want to sign up today. Up next, we've got CoinKite. I absolutely love these guys. Once you get your hands on those non-KYC sats, you're probably going to want to secure it with the best hardware on the market. And you can't go wrong with the stuff coming out of CoinKite. I love my cold card Mark IV. It is an absolute beast and there's so many great advanced features on it. They've also got great stuff like the tap signer, the block clock, the open dime, all kinds of great stuff. And coming down the pipe soon, the cold card Q1, which looks fantastic. If you want to check them out, head over to coinkite.com and use code BTC sessions for 5% off everything in the store. Now, if you're looking to go beyond just a single SIG security option, then Nunchuck has you covered with the best assisted multi-sig setup in the game on top of it with baked in inheritance planning. So this thing is an absolute beast, super easy to use. Uh, you can get it on your mobile device. It walks you through every single step of the way. You can use it with great stuff like the tap signer and the cold card and a bunch of other hardware options. You get set up with an assisted multi-sig, which means that they will hold a single key, a just in case key for you. And they also set up your inheritance plan. So you know that your next of kin will get their sats that they're entitled to no problem. And the best part about it all, one of my favorite things, is the fact that you also do not need KYC for this setup at all either. You don't need any personal information here. Um, and that sets it apart from other options on the market. So check them out, nunchuck.io. And I do have a full tutorial on them as well. And finally, Start9, your sovereign computing solution. Uh, you can run your full Bitcoin stack here. So Bitcoin Core, Lightning Node, things like mempool.space and join market. You can also host your own data, things like password managers and files and photos. You can even host Nostra relays and Nostra clients on this thing. It's an absolute beast. Be sure to check out my full tutorial on it. Now, if you're looking for something low key, something simple to get started with, you can head over to start9.com and grab the uh, embassy one. Or if you're looking for something really beefy, high end computing uh, to host your whole life on, you can check out the embassy pro. So yeah, check them out, start9.com and check out my tutorial on setting up your embassy today. And with that, let's dive into the tutorial. So out the gate, let's address the questions of why would you do this and who is this for? Well, this is going to be a fantastic learning tool for those of you that are curious about the inner workings of Bitcoin mining. What we're effectively doing here is we're taking a device, the S9, the Antminer S9, uh, something that has is in general not profitable for Bitcoin mining today because it is an older device that uh, people would say is near the end of its life cycle, and we're repurposing it um, as a learning tool and as a, uh, as a secondary effect, a way to reduce the cost of heating your home. And so what we're doing, normally ASICs, uh, Bitcoin miners, are quite loud. The fans can um, be very, very loud, and then they also kick off some heat. 
what we're doing is we're trying to reduce the noise so that it works as a space heater. And the way that we do that is we replace the fans with fans that run much quieter and we go into the operating system and we reduce the number of watts that the device is using as well as the speed at which the fans spin. And what you end up getting is a decent amount of heat being kicked off this thing and having it be pretty quiet. Uh, in my experience, it's quieter than my regular space heater that I would use and it uses about half the power of the space heater that I would normally use. And I get paid back in Bitcoin or at least get paid back a portion of the power that I'm using in Bitcoin, which is nice because I was gonna be using that electricity anyways. So we're gonna go all the way through that. Uh, let's chat about the prerequisites, what you're gonna need to know, um, what you're gonna need to get, and then we'll dive into the build. So let's talk prerequisites. What are you gonna to need to know get and do before partaking in this video. Well, first up, um, check out the Crypto Cloaks Future of Space Heaters guide because this is effectively what I was using as I went through this video. It's pretty detailed um, and then I've tried to fill in any of the gaps uh, with things that I kind of learned as I went through it as well, but it will be definitely helpful to you as you uh, pick apart this guide. In particular, um, there is a parts list here uh, that gives you exactly what you need to get in terms of the fans and everything and getting that upgraded. So I'm gonna link that in the show notes. Go take a look at that parts list. It'll have links directly to buy uh, everything that you need. Now, one thing I'll say is uh, pay attention to the quantity on the side there, okay? Um, so you need uh, a couple things in, in particular, make sure that you get two of the, the main fans because I mistakenly just got one initially and uh, needed to quickly order a second one in the midst of making this video because I wasn't paying attention. Um, all the 3D printed stuff you can get directly from Crypto Cloaks. That's the stuff that I used. Um, also the screws, uh, I, I, kind of had to hodgepodge together a little bit because I didn't order them. I just had to sort through stuff in the basement that I had sitting around in my toolboxes and everything. So um, yeah, you know, maybe just grab those, those screws in case. Um, and that's about that. Uh, now, in terms of getting yourself an S9, where do you get uh, a miner? Where do you get, um, especially something that's been on the market for years and years now, you're likely gonna be getting it second hand and so i found kaboom racks is an excellent place to go you can go to kaboomracks.com shout out to nick there also who helped me in my journey he created uh, on the kaboom racks uh, youtube channel how to dismantle an asic how to take apart an uh, an s9 he just shows kind of all the different parts and that was very helpful you can look that up on the kaboom racks youtube channel and that should help you in your journey but nonetheless the way that Kaboom Racks works is they source and, and basically create a, a marketplace for used ASICs. And so you can go through there and just keep your eyes open for S9s and, uh, and you can find them for pretty cheap, 100, 100 and something dollars uh, for an old S9. It shouldn't be an issue to, to find one. Um, other than that, you're going to need to download a program called Belina Etcher. You can go to belina.io slash etcher. I'll link that down below. Um, you're also going to need an IP scanner. There's a couple different options. Uh, angry IP scanner at angryip.org is one option. The one I'm going to be using today because I'm on a Mac is called uh, Landscan. If it'll show here, there we go. Landscan. Um, it is a paid one and it's, there's no subscription or anything. It's just, you buy the program once. And so this is what I've used and it's pretty easy. You're also gonna need a Bitcoin wallet because if you're mining Bitcoin, you're gonna need to have it sent somewhere. And so any Bitcoin wallet will do as long as you can just grab an address from it. I'm gonna be using Sparrow wallet cause it's kind of my default desktop option. Uh, but really you can use anything. I do have a tutorial on Sparrow too, if you wanna learn about it. And the last thing you'll need is tools. Uh, not much in terms of tools, like some screwdrivers and different uh, heads and everything. I found actually having a drill was helpful because some of the screws on the S9 were 
difficult to get in there and make sure that you try different heads because you can strip some of those screws pretty easily if you're not careful. Um, but yeah, screwdrivers, maybe some pliers to get in there for some of the tighter angles when you need to hold like a nut in place and everything. Yeah, um, and you should just be fine with that. So more or less, that's, that's what you're gonna need. And uh, yeah, we can dive into getting this thing built now. Okay, so what I have here in terms of what you're gonna need is, this is my S9, which I bought used uh, from, well actually I was gifted, funny enough, uh, used in exchange for a BV lightning channel, but uh, this is an S9 miner. So just so you know, there is uh, the main body of it and that's the power supply and then obviously the plug-in cable, okay? The main body, just so you know, there's two fans, one on the front, one on the rear. Uh, and then inside of the power supply, there's also a fan. So the other parts that I need, uh, this is a large fan. It will go on one of the ends here. You actually need two of these, silly me. I forgot to get a second one. It is arriving tomorrow, but you'll see it when <laughs> I start putting it together. Uh, this fan here is going to be the one that replaces the one in the power supply. Uh, we also have this um, this dongle that will basically it's uh, it goes onto one of the uh, cables in one of the fans uh, in this fan so that it can connect correctly. Um, then we have how are we going to connect it to the internet? And you could do Ethernet. Um, Hopefully I won't need this because I bought uh, this thing, which is for Wi-Fi. So I'll be able to connect it through Wi-Fi, hopefully, and be able to just plug the thing directly into the wall and that's it. And then finally, we've got our Crypto Cloaks enclosure, and this is what the whole thing is going to go inside of. All right, so you've got the, 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 main, the main thing here. That's where the miner's gonna go inside. And then uh, these are basically just extensions so that the new fans will fit onto the side here. So we're going to take that fan off, put this in, and then affix the new fan on top of this. So basically just to allow it to be the right size. And then this is just a, a package of screws that was provided by Crypto Cloaks along with some fancy stickers. So yeah, that's basically everything that I'm working with here. I'm also going to need... A screwdriver which I've got going and then actually I did practice take a take apart um, this miner and I did require a drill just because some of the screws were pretty tight and I didn't want to strip them and this seemed to do the trick so yeah that's it your s9 your fans of which I'm missing one uh, your adapter here uh, to connect one of the fans your Wi-Fi or if you're using ethernet and then your casing along with the adapters for the fans and the screws and that should have you set this entire list is linked uh in the show notes aka i'm linking the guide that crypto cloaks put together which has the list in there and you should be able to find basically all of this stuff on amazon other than your asic Okay, so first things first, I'm actually gonna take the power supply and I'm going to disconnect it. Now, uh, I, I wanna do that so that I can get to um, basically this board here because there's one change we're gonna make to the board or make sure that is already uh, the case with your board and that has to do with uh, the firmware we're gonna be running on it. You may not understand exactly what's going on, we'll refer to it later, but just follow along here and you will be fine. Uh, so what I wanna do is all of the cables coming from this, I'm going to disconnect. Now these cables, um, there's a little latch on each of them and you, can, you might not be able to see it perfectly here, but there's a, a button you can press, but you can actually get two fingers in there and also pull from the bottom just to kind of unlatch it. And then once it's unfastened, you should be able to just kind of pull up and it will, uh, it will come out of its socket. So it will look like that. So you can see there's that little, little, uh, clip there. Okay, so we're going to do this for every single one of these 
uh, power cables, including the one on the board here. We'll get it all done and this will be disconnected and out of our way. Okay, perfect. So we've got all these disconnected. We can now take the power supply, put it off to the side. We're all set there. So up next, what I wanna do is I'm going to disconnect the front fan here. And that's just this little cable running from the fan to the board. Again, you can just kind of loosen and pull upwards on it. And it does take a little bit of wiggling, okay? But it will come loose. All right, so once that is disconnected, four screws on the front. I'm gonna unscrew those with my screwdriver and I should be able to remove the fan. All right, with all those unscrewed, I can now remove this fan. I'm just gonna put it off to the side here. And this is what you've got here. These are the internals, these are the boards. Um, but there is this plate in front. It is also secured by four screws. Now in my experience, these screws were very tight. This is where I needed the drill. Also be aware if you've got a Phillips head screwdriver and the bit is uh, a little small, you run the risk of stripping these. Um, one tactic that I've heard is helpful sometimes if you do end up stripping these is you take a rubber band and you place it over and then you use the drill to unscrew. Um, I'm lucky enough that these were okay and I'm able to use the drill to basically unscrew one, two, three, four and get this plate off. Reason being is we're gonna actually pull these boards out in order to actually get a look at uh, the control board up here. Okay, so I'll unscrew these and then we'll be right back. Okay, I've unscrewed those. I have screws off to the side. This is the plate um, that would go on here. Now it's removed. We are all set. Now, these are the hash boards. They do slide out um, and you can disconnect them from the control board here. I'm gonna do that now. Um, I'm going to disconnect the hash boards themselves, not the main, uh, the control board. So again, um, you're just gonna, there's kind of a little clip here you can press on the top and that will make it loose. And then you should be able to, and again, these things can be tight, but it basically slides out and there you can see there's the little clip that you press on to get it up. And then once these are loosened, these boards can slide in and out. There's kind of these grooves that they slide along. I'll get all of these disconnected and then we'll slide them out and put them off to the side. Okay, so these are disconnected. When you slide these out, I'll show you what it looks like. And you be careful, you don't wanna drop this, but this is your hash board. And um, you may find if you bought secondhand, perhaps it's a little dirty, uh, you can use compressed air and spray it out. I did that earlier and I got, you know, hopefully a bunch of it out. Still a little dirty, but should be okay. So you basically, why are we doing this? We're sliding these out so we can get access to this board because this board also slides out, but it can't do that with the hash boards in the way. So basically you're gonna carefully slide these out and you're gonna put them off to the side and then we'll have access to the control board up top. Okay. Boards are out. We now have the control board. There's just these two little, um, I don't even know what to call them. Anyways, these two little clips, uh, you just push them out and then you can slide the board straight out. You may need to disconnect that other fan. In fact, I'm gonna do that right now. Just gonna slide it upwards. There we go. Okay, so that's disconnected, which means I can pull out my control board, which looks like so. Okay, there's literally the one thing we want to do with this. Let's get it right centered here. Okay, so what we're looking at is these, uh, these things here, okay? They slide off straight up like so. What you want is the configuration that I have here. I know I just slid it off, but I'm putting it right back in the same place. You want it to be top one uh, and okay ethernet port on the right hand side if you're looking at it top one 
top one is furthest to the left, next one furthest to the right, third one furthest to the left, next one furthest to the right. So that's kind of this side to side like zigzag that you've got. Top one to the left, bottom one to the right, all right? So that's what you're doing. They slide off very easily and this basically allows the board to boot from the SD card. We're gonna be formatting this later, putting on our uh, OS onto this SD card and we want, when we turn on the miner, it to say, okay, I'm gonna access the SD card for my operating system, all right? And doing that, doing this configuration with these circuits will say, go to the SD card, all right? So again, left, right, left, right in a zigzag. And now we reassemble. Now I'm only going to reassemble up until this point. I have the plate back on, uh, but I do not have the fan. Why? Well, we're not gonna use this fan anymore. We've got new ones that are much quieter, so we're going to replace that. But I'm gonna put this aside. We're gonna deal with the power supply right now first. And actually, as a matter of fact, while we're at it, we can go ahead and we can take off the back fan too. One, two, three, four. There's a grill on it. Uh, but we're going to remove this from the back and uh, because obviously we're replacing that too. All right, fan off, off to the side. All set. Up next, we're gonna take our power supply and on each side of it, there are three screws. I've already begun to loosen this side, but you're gonna take one, two, three out on both sides and that will allow you to take off this top plate and see the inside so that we can begin replacing the fan. With those screws off, I can lift this off. Now there might be a film in there that you can take out, but this gives you full access to the innards. In particular, we're interested with this guy here. Um, and so there's also four screws on the front here that we're gonna remove that'll take off the grill and we'll also loosen up so we can remove the fan. Now the fan has a power cable that uh, I believe sweeps back through um, and then we can disconnect back there. But we'll get into that in a moment. Let's take off this, uh, this first. Okay, grill is removed with the screws. Um, it may be a little tight in there, but uh, I already loosened mine out, but you should be able to pull out the fan and you can see the power cable sweeps back and around a few things and disconnects. We've got to disconnect it in here. Same as some of the other cables that we've used before. Um, and yeah, we're just gonna pry this thing loose. Okay, and you can see it's just a, a little two pin connector cable. So we've got that out. This we're no longer gonna use and we're gonna use one of the new fans that we just grabbed and the adapter that we also added to turn it into a two pin connector cable. Okay, so this is the fan that I have here, NF A6 by 25. It's a 60 by 25 millimeter premium fan from Noctua. Looks like so. Okay, so here's the replacement fan that we have. Now, this comes with a whole bunch of extra crap that you're likely not gonna need. Uh, so you can put that off to the side. Uh, the main thing is the fan that we got, as well as um, I got these uh, basically converters. This three pin fan won't fit into the port in the power source, so we need to convert it via this thing. Basically, this will just plug in here like, like so. Okay, that looks like it's all connected. And so this converter basically just allows us, now it's a two pin, I can plug that in easily to the power source there. So we're, we'll get this into place first um, and screw it back in exactly where the other fan used to be, and then we'll get the power source or get it plugged into the power source. 
Okay, so I screwed it into place with the old screws that were there, put the grate back on top. By the way, make sure that the logo of this fan is on the inside, not on the outside. You want to make sure the airflow is going the right direction. Uh, and then we've just got this little cable here, and that's all that's left. And that will plug into this here, this little notch right there, right where the old one was. Uh, there's two little tracks on the bottom, okay, and that will go in the empty space. There's a there's a little divot for it there. So pretty much, I'm just going to slide it in like so. Oops. Okay, so that's now connected. Now we just need to tuck away this cable as best we can. I'm going to kind of mimic what they had going before. So they slid its in along here, and then... Again, this will just kind of be tucked in there, I guess. All right, and so that is all set. We're going to put the cover back on, put the three screws in on each side, and we're done with the power supply. And once it's back on, here we are, all set. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is um, we're going to be putting in our new big fans that I showed you before. Um, however, there's another issue with the connectors from the old fans versus the new fans. And that is that on the old fans, there's these two little divots, if you can see here. So there's these two lines here that fit into the port on the miner. However, on the new fan we got, those are differently positioned. So one is, is slightly inwards. So what we need to do is we basically just need to take off these pins and put the old ones on. And so this is kind of, I was a little confused by it at first, but basically on the one side, there's these little metal bits and this is the pin release and it will allow you to take the cables out of this adapter here. And so basically what you want to do is you're going to take a, like a push pin or something. And this allows you to press down on, on a little clip in there. And so when you press down on it, it'll actually allow you to release uh, one of the cables. So, okay. So, so by pressing down on that, you're able to slide out. The cable and you're going to do that for each one until this part comes off so again okay there's number two and i'll go all the way through at the end of that you don't need the old fan you just want this thing right here because that's what's going to fit on to the new fan okay so we're going to keep this part and we're doing the same thing on the black one um so again there's the four little metal parts we need to press down to release the cables and then those cables will go inside of the old cap so that we can plug it easily into the miner itself. Okay so I actually had a hell of a time doing this with the black one um, mostly because it had this additional tape that was binding all these together and it made it hard to get my hands on individual cables so I actually went in with just some like nail scissors and I cut the tape off of it a little bit so I could you know actually use my dexterity to get a hold of these things um, and again it's it's just getting used to where to push and and pulling a, an individual cable out so you know it takes a little bit to get them all going but this is what it'll look like in the end you'll have four cables all like so and then we're gonna be putting them back in here, but we gotta make sure we put them in the right order. You can't just put them in any order. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so you want the ridges on the white piece facing you, and you're going to put the cables in like so. You want it to go blue on top. So it's gonna go blue, green, yellow, black. That is the order that you're putting them in. 
every time you put in a cable, push it until you hear a click. Might not be audible in the video, but, and then also the, the, the parts that are sticking out, the little hook looking things, those are also going towards the divots, okay? So the flat side down with the flat side of the board, okay? The hooks are going up towards these little ridges, okay? So again, once they're all connected, they should all be clicked into place. When you turn it around, you should see that everything, all the metal parts inside are more or less in line as they were before, okay? So again, blue, green, yellow, then black, and you should be all set. So we're now going to affix our fans, which by the way, you will have done that twice because you've got two of these. Uh, so you'll have changed the pins out twice, two times over. And we're going to be using the fans now. The, uh, these are little adapters that will go on the front end and back end of the miner that you will have gotten from Crypto Cloaks. I've got two different colors. So basically what we're doing here we're also using the screws provided by uh, Crypto Cloaks here. All right, there's uh, a, a bunch of them here. Anyways, we're going to uh, be screwing in this to the plate. Notice that there's four uh, inner ones, four inner screw holes, okay? Those will affix this adapter and then the fan will go onto the adapter afterwards. So let's get this adapter on first. Also, you're going to be using the screws, uh, the rounded head ones that Crypto Cloak sends over with its adapters and its enclosure. Basically, you're going to fix this on top. Um, I've got the screws already kind of set in there, but you're going to fix this on top, screw it in. Then you're going to take your fan and on this side, you're going to have the uh, logo of the fan facing out and then the cable up at the top towards where the power is so that you can then plug it in, okay? So we'll get this all screwed in and see what it looks like. So I've got the adapter here uh, affixed to the miner, but I've got to say getting this fan onto here with the provided screws is proving to be a veritable nightmare. And I'll show you why. It's because these are not long screws, which means that I would have to kind of insert them in between. And these holes are very, very slim. So you need a, a really, really skinny screwdriver just to get in there, which I do not have. Like I've got a pretty skinny one here, but like just, it, it does not go. So, uh, and anything that I have smaller is, does not have an, a large enough uh, head to actually catch the threads here and actually put it in. So I'm going to have to get inventive here. We're going to see what we can come up with. Okay. So I found my solution here. Uh, if you'll recall, the old fans had these long, uh, these long screws in them. And I had, uh, some of these, these nuts kicking around. Uh, so what I did is I basically just screwed them through as you don't even need to screw them. They'll just slide right in. Uh, but I went as far as I can. You do run into some resistance with some, uh, the body of the ASIC itself, but I was able to put uh, the nut on the bottom and affix it and it's pretty secure. It's not really rattling around or anything. So I think that should suffice. I asked around, people have done similar things to this. Uh, and also I've even heard of people like zip tying this and it works just fine. Um, so yeah, I mean, get inventive. We're, <laughs> we're building a space heater from an ASIC here. So yeah, you can really do whatever, whatever works for you. This seems to be working for me. So this is what I'm going with and this is what we got. Okay, so we've got everything all affixed, both fans. Now I, I want to review really quick what we have here. On the side with the ethernet port, the fan will be uh, sticker in, all right? And the reason sticker is in, that is the direction of the airflow. There's also a little arrow, though it may be hard to see, pointing the direction of the airflow. So the air is gonna be flowing in, up through the bottom, and then on the other side, the 
uh, the logo is facing out, there's also an arrow indicating that the airflow will be going out the top. This will be the top of your heater, okay? So from there, we've got the two connection cables. The one at the top, I'm just gonna put it back where it was before, which was the innermost connection. And again, it just slides down into place like so. And same with the other one. By the way, the little ridges, uh, the ridges will be uh, facing out to the closest side, aka facing out to the little um, little thing sticking up here. <laughs> and slide down into place like so. Okay. So now we've got both our connections for our power for our fans. Um, these will be tucked away. We'll find inventive ways to figure out where those will go momentarily. Uh, but nonetheless, everything's all connected. Just a side note in regards to affixing the fans and the screws and everything. Again, you're gonna have to play around and figure out what works for you. You can see I use the original long screws because the other ones I found too much of a pain to try and get in here and try and screw it from in between uh, these two ridges. Uh, also, I found, and you know, this comes with 3D printing, sometimes the holes for certain screws, like um, it worked fine for this side, for the top side, uh, but just affixing the bracket here, the, the um, to basically affix this larger fan, the 3D print here, the screw heads were a little bit large, so I had to rustle around and find some alternatives. Um, be aware if you use alternative screws with this, um, with a smaller head, if, you, if you're playing around or you're using something different, be hyper aware of where the screws are going inside because if they're long, you may end up actually screwing into some of the hash boards and destroying your miner. So don't do that. Up next, we want to reattach the power supply. So that was all these cables here. Uh, pretty much one of them is going to go... I'm, I'm basically putting them back where they were. If you uh, need to take a picture before you take everything apart, of course, that's always helpful. But nonetheless, um, yeah, I've got... Just press them into place. You'll hear them click. And you go all the way through. You, you plug it in every single one of these all the way down and you should be all good. Presto, everything's all connected, back to normal. Next thing is just to plug it in and hope to God that everything still functions. This part is pretty self-explanatory, but basically you've got a power cable and it goes into the back of the power supply. Now, if you buy a used S9, it may not come along with one of these. It just kind of depends who you grab it from, but this is just a basic computer cable pretty much. So it just plugs into the back and into the wall. And let's see, fingers crossed that all the fans work. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for this fan here and both fans on either side to spin. So please do. Okay. We are in business. Took a second, so don't freak out if it doesn't work right away. Um, I saw the power supply one kick on first. I saw both ends of the miner kick on for a second and then turn off, and now they're back up and running. Of course, this is running louder than it will be because we're gonna be ramping down the power on it, but holy crap, I already noticed a huge difference in sound and noise reduction just from the fans themselves. And so cranking it down, uh, hopefully that'll be bringing it down even further so that we can enjoy some heat and get a little bit of money back in the process while we heat our room.
Okay, so up next, we're going to be getting the Brains OS firmware uh, so that we can have greater control over the miner itself and be able to ramp down the fans and the power going through it so that it's not too loud. And so what you're going to need here is you're going to need a micro SD card, um, which you would have seen in the video was in the back of the device. I'm not saying it comes with one, you need to have one. So again, like a 16 gigabyte one will do you just fine. And then secondly, you're gonna go and you're gonna download this program called Belina Etcher. Uh, so belina.io slash a slash etcher and you'll download that program and install it. I've already got it installed on my computer here and I will link to this down below. Up next, you're going to be going uh, to a couple different spots. Um, this, by the way, is the documentation on brains.com. And so this gives you a, a pretty good rundown of, of what you're doing to install Brains OS. And uh, earlier on in the build, we took apart the S9 and we did something uh, to these which are known as the jumpers and we put them in a particular configuration that zigzag configuration I was talking about and this is so that we will be booting from the SD card uh, so that we can then use the operating system that is on it. Uh, so that is already done. Um, and basically all we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking the firmware or the software, we're going to be installing it on the SD card, and then we're going to be putting the SD card into the device so that it boots from it. And so uh, it does give uh, links and everything to download the SD card uh, image from their website. So from this page here, uh, it has lots of links here to be able to do that. Um, it will take you to this screen. More or less, just so you know, there's a whole bunch of options here. There's an SD card option down at the bottom, but all of these download buttons will spit you out to the exact same folder, which is just a Google Drive folder, and it has all the different ones. They are labeled, where you're gonna be downloading the one that says run from SD. You can just right click it and you can hit download and download that file to your computer. Uh, once you have downloaded that, um, which I will do right now. We'll hit download and download anyways. Off it goes. Okay, so I've got uh, that file on my uh, in my downloads folder and we're now gonna be using Belina Etcher, which I told you to download already. And we're gonna be putting this file onto that card, not just dragging it over, but flashing it, meaning like s installing it so it's a bootable drive, not just here's a file, okay? So we'll see how to do that in the next section. Okay, so here is Belina Etcher open on my computer. I'm gonna hit flash from file. We'll find that file right here in my downloads folder, hit open. Next, we're gonna hit select target. We will find our generic mass storage device. There's a 16 gigabyte one right there. We will check it off. We'll hit select and we'll hit flash. This will take a little bit of time. It'll go through some stuff. You got to put in your password for your computer in order to do this. I'm on a Mac, of course. Uh, flashes all the information to the drive. And then at the very end, it'll give you a finished message, at which point you can eject the disk and put it into your miner. So flash complete, everything is all set, and we can basically X out of this, and we can eject the device while it auto ejects it. And out of my computer it comes, and we're ready to use it in our device. Let's jump over to the miner. Okay, so that SD card is gonna go in with the pins facing up into the SD card slot. It'll be a little bit more finicky because the, the fan is, uh, is close, so you gotta get it in there, and it just kind of clicks into place. Uh, it has a little spring mechanism, so to get it out again, you just push, it'll, it'll spring right back out. Okay, up next, for the time being, I'm gonna be using my ethernet cable to plug this directly into my router. I will show how to set up Wi-Fi in a bit, but for now we're just gonna do the simple option to get things rolling. All right, so ethernet cable in there. I'm gonna run this other end over to my router in the corner. All right, plugged it in here. Obviously no signal yet, it's not plugged in, but we'll do that next. 
plug it into the wall, let it boot up, and then uh, we will look for it in our network and we'll see how, but. Okay, booting up, we see green lights, we see things happening, that's all good. Uh, and so it'll take a second to start spinning and start getting signal and all of that good stuff. And then we will figure out what is up on the computer. Of course, mess accords, we'll sort that later. Okay, so we got the miner up and running. It Obviously there's gonna be some noise in the background. I'm not sure how much that's registering uh, through the mic here, but obviously you'll be able to hear it. Um, what we need to do now is we need to look up the device on our local network because it's plugged in. Um, it's plugged into the ethernet, into our router, all of that stuff. And so you're gonna download either something, um, there's, so a lot of options out there. Angry IP Scanner is one of them at angryip.org. I'll link that below. The one I'm using right now is called uh, Landscan and it's on the Mac App Store. Uh, and it is a paid one, one time. Obviously you don't have to subscribe or anything, but I, I bought the program anyways, it was like 10 bucks. Uh, and I use it quite often anyways, cause I'm running nodes and other things. Nonetheless, um, I'm not going to pull up the program right now, but basically what you do is you open it up. Uh, there's a button that says start scan. It'll scan your network for all of the devices that are connected to it. And in that uh, list, you're going to see one that is labeled Antminer S9. All you need to do is copy the IP address of that device. Um, in Landscan, you can right click and it'll say copy IP address. Uh, I believe the same is true of Angry IP, uh, Angry IP Scanner. Anyways, you're just copying that information and you'll be able to see what the IP address is and you're literally just going to paste that in to, your, uh, to the address bar of your browser on your computer once you have put in the IP address of your device into your browser window and you go to that website, it will take you to your Brains OS login screen. Now, this will prompt you for a username and password. This can vary from what I've heard depending on uh, I guess the version that you're running. Um, I've heard a, a lot of different things. What ended up working for me was uh, the default credentials were username root, like R-O-O-T, and password admin, A-D-M-I-N. Now I've heard other combinations like root root or root with no password whatsoever. So try what I did first and then try a combination of the others that I mentioned and one of them will get you in, okay? So this boots us to our dashboard and our dashboard is where we can set everything, including turning down those fans and linking up to a mining pool. The first thing we're actually going to do is we're going to set up our mining pool because the, the fan settings and everything will basically be moot if we're not actually hashing and not actually mining Bitcoin because the thing won't actually be getting warm. So uh, we're going to go to pool dot brains dot com and brains is with two eyes um, and so I already have an account here you basically sign up with nothing more than an email address uh, so I'm just gonna hit login all right there's a little verification all right so I've logged into brains pool and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go over to the left where it says workers we're gonna hit connect workers little blue button here and then you're going to choose a location. Typically, you're going to choose somewhere in the world that's close to you. Um, however, I would like to be on Stratum V2, which is the mining protocol. I'm not going to dive deep into what that is, but um, yeah, that, that's kind of my choice. So I want to make sure there's jurisdiction where I can use it. Now, I'm in Canada. If I select Canada, for some reason, I don't, I can't use uh, Stratum V2. So. Uh, USA East Coast let's see well there we go I've got an option there and yeah other than that doesn't look too promising so I'm just gonna go with stratum v2 there on USA East Coast and then I'm gonna copy this information here all right um, I'm now 
going to head over to uh, my dashboard for Brains OS, and I'm going to use this information here. And then I'm going to have my user, di user ID and password um, that will be used with this. So here on my Brains OS, I'm going to go to, I can on the main screen, I can scroll down to where it says pools and say edit pools. This is also accessible just by hitting configuration up top and going to the pools tab. Um, if you don't have a pool group, uh, it will make you, it, it, well, it'll automatically give you one, but you can have different groups of various pools. You can point your miner at any pool you want. This is just the example I'm doing today. If you scroll down to the bottom, there's add new pool. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to paste in the URL I just saved. Um, I'm going to put in my username and I'm going to put in my password. Password can be really anything that you want. By the way, if, uh, if you'd like to have a worker name, um, you can add like a dot whatever you want. Um, so I might actually do that. So BTC sessions dot uh, space heater. Sure, I'll use that. And then you're going to put in your password. It does show. So um, I'm going to type that out and then I'll hit save after that. Okay, so I hit save and I navigated away from that um, so that I'm not going to be showing my password here. But now we can see pool status alive, tuner status running, everything's kind of up and running. And if I jump and there goes my hash rate going up. Uh, so I am actually mining now. Um, and then I can hit connected on brains pool. Go back. All right. So from here, I'll be able to go back to the dashboard and it will take a moment they say be patient it'll take a little while to show up and and be ready to go uh, with your miner so we'll check back in a moment okay so things are now beginning to run now again it's they said on brains pool it can take a while to kind of update and you know as i as i'm refreshing i'm getting kind of updated stats here in terms of uh, terahash and all terahash per second and all of that. It does say it's listed as offline here for my space heater. However, if I go to my brains OS dashboard, I can see that things are running. Uh, you know, I see the hash rate there. I see uh, the temperature of the device itself. It says the pool status is alive. Everything's running. And uh, yeah, again, down below pools, it says it's alive, it's active. So I imagine that will be reflected on my dashboard and brains shortly. But for now, let's go and tweak our settings on our miner within brains OS, not the brains pool website, but our actual device here. And we're gonna tweak it so that these fans are quieter. So we're maybe not hashing as much. Obviously we're not gonna be making as much Bitcoin, uh, but we just kind of wanna regulate the temperature in our room and get a little Bitcoin in the process. So uh, Crypto Cloaks, of course, has their guide here. Um, and I will link that down below, but on page 14, they have their favorite settings. So 650 watts, a fan speed at about 55%, a chip temperature of around 80 degrees Celsius, and that gets the noise down. And our terahash will drop from where it is, but that's okay. So how do we do that? Well, on our dashboard, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into configuration and we're gonna to go to performance. So for performance, we wanna change our wattage and we want it at 650 watts. So we're gonna double click here, type in, type in 650 and we're gonna hit save and apply. Okay, up next, we're gonna go over on the left to temperature and fans. Uh, under temperature, right now it's on auto, leave that for a second. You're gonna type in 80 for the target temperature you're gonna type in, we'll say 85 for the hot temperature, and we'll type in 90 for the dangerous temperature, and we are going to save and apply that. And then we're gonna hit manual, we're gonna hit understood, and we're gonna change the speed of our fans to 55%, and we're gonna hit save and apply as well. Now that will change out the target temperature 
um, it'll just kind of like nullify it and 85 is now our hot and 90 is our dangerous temperature. So that will stay. Nonetheless, that is all applied now. We can go back to our dashboard. And so what we wanna do is we're actually going to use quick actions and we're gonna hit restart boss miner so that all of those changes will take place. I can already tell that the fans are down at a reasonable level. It's kind of nice actually. But just to make sure everything's all good, we can do a restart of the miner itself. It'll boot back up and we'll be all set and ready to go. And just before we do, we can recheck in here on brains pool just in case. Yes, okay, so our worker status is now updated to okay, um, and it will uh, change our hash rate the longer we've been hashing and kind of reach an equilibrium there of what we're actually getting. But we can see on our dashboard here, our hash rate right now is climbing from three terahash a second up towards what I imagine is here uh, listed around 8.25 is where we'll max out, it would appear. Uh, but I've got to say the, the fans seem to be going good. I don't even know if I need to restart, but if I did, I can do it from the quick actions and restart boss miner. Now, you do need to set where your payments from the mining pool are going to go. So we're going to do that now. So from your main screen in brains, you can head to funds and it'll say financial accounts. And uh, I believe by default you'll have a Bitcoin account, but if not, you can hit add new account and name it and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, I've got one here. I'm gonna click on it and uh, you can do your payout settings and, and all of that. Okay, so it says, I have no payout settings. We recommend you set up payouts to receive your rewards regularly. So I'm gonna hit set payout rule. We're gonna choose a payout wallet uh, I need to create a new one. I don't currently have one set up. And so we're going to uh, give this one a name. We'll just call it uh, mining or yeah, that should be fine. Okay, and then you need an address for the wallet. So I'm actually gonna go to Sparrow Wallet on desktop and I'm gonna set that up right now. Okay, so here I am with Sparrow Wallet. If you're unfamiliar, go to full tutorial. I will link it down below or you can just search it on my YouTube channel. But nonetheless, I'm gonna hit file, new wallet. Uh, we'll call this mining. We'll hit create wallet. Uh, we just want a single SIG. No settings that I really need to change here. I need a new or imported software wallet. We're going to set it up. Uh, I'll just do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave it as 24 words. We'll hit generate new. It's gonna ask me to confirm the words and then I'm gonna hit create key store. I'm kind of glossing all this over. This can come from any Bitcoin wallet that you choose and uh, you just need a Bitcoin address where payouts will go to. So I'm gonna set this up and then we'll grab an address from it. All right, so wallet's all set up, I'm just gonna hit receive and we'll just call this uh, address brains. Uh, S9 and I'm gonna hit copy we'll jump back and we're going to paste in uh, we'll paste in that address and I'll set that up okay and trigger type um, we'll set a threshold of an amount of Bitcoin or maybe a time interval maybe let's do a time interval maybe let's do I don't know we can let it build a little bit. I don't want a bunch of small UTXOs. So I'm going to say once every month or once every two months or something like that. Um, okay. Well, weekly or monthly. I guess those are my options. All right. Monthly. We'll do monthly. Um, day of the month. We'll just do the first of every month. Okay. That works. Confirm changes. Okay. We'll enter our password. Okay, that will send off an email confirmation to you, which you then just uh, click and confirm. So we'll be back when we do that. All right, and once I've done that, I'm bumped to this page, which now says payout settings. I have monthly on the first day, uh, and I have the destination to mining S9, and there's my BTC address that it goes to. It says payouts have been verified. Fantastic, we are all set up. And so now, once a month, I'll get a payout going to that address sitting in Sparrow and um, 
yeah, it'll just gradually build up there. And I'm not expecting, obviously, much to come in through there, uh, but it it slightly offsets the cost of what it would have been to plug in a regular space heater anyways. And that's all you need. You're basically mitigating your cost for some sort of energy use that you would have been using and just paying outright for. Let's just kind of take a look at everything that we have here. Um, uh, on our dashboard, again, we have our overall stats, which shows us our, our hash rate, as well as the temperature, depending on the line you're looking at. And that just kind of keeps it up to date right there in front of you. You can separate them by going hash rate, and you can also check out your temperature and all of uh, you know everything, the different chips and boards and all that stuff, what their temperatures are at. Over here on the right, you have your real hash rate, you have your chip temperature, you have estimated efficiency, your power usage, um, your pool status, your tuner status, the fan monitor, it shows what my fans are running at. And then down below, you have the individual hash boards and what they're doing, um, your pool, and yeah, pretty much all of it is there in front of you. If I jump back to Brains OS, or sorry, Brains Pool, so logged in online to the mining pool I'm using, I can see my hash rate, which will be lagging compared to what I can see in my dashboard here, uh, just due to, again, it's it's it takes data uh, a little bit more slowly. It's not fully up to date. So this will reach the same level as what I'm seeing in my dashboard eventually, but I can see my worker status. I've got a device that is online and working right here and it's labeled space heater. And yeah, that is, that is all good. Now there's one more thing I want to show here in your dashboard for brains OS. And it's one of the most important things that you can do. You got to go over here to system and you got to turn on dark mode. Cause I mean, my eyes, come on. Uh, but apart from that, uh, everything much looks much better um, when that is going. And and yeah, we're we're pretty much all set up here, good to go. And um, yeah, that that's about it. Now I have noticed one thing, a little side note here, and you may hear it momentarily, but I do find my my chip temperatures are getting up close to um, that eighty five degree range that I set as my. Oh, there they kick in again. So. Basically what's happening is the chip temperatures are getting just high enough where it's kind of ramping up the fans once in a while to get them down below. Um, and so I have two options. I can lower the wattage at this point so that I'm hashing less and thus the chip temperatures will be lower, or I can change my, my warning temperatures to be a little bit higher so that the fans don't kick in as often. And this is where the tweaking comes in for myself and for you, um, in that, is it warm enough? Is it not warm enough? Do you need to change around your wattage? And this is where the tweaking comes and where you get to play around. So I've got a small office here and so it gets warmer. And so maybe I might want to bump the wattage down so that I'm not sweating like crazy. And so that the fans don't need to be kicking in and out like this repeatedly. So I'm going to keep tweaking it, but more or less we've got our setup here. And when I want to change those again, I can go to configuration. I can change the wattage here. I can change the temperature and fans here, and I can set that until it hits that equilibrium that I'm looking for. And then uh, I can give it a save and apply. And if I need to, I can go to quick actions and I can restart the miner or reboot the device. Either way, uh, we're pretty much all set. So I just wanted to add this little part here is after a few days of actually playing with the device now that it's all set up, I did notice um, that the I, I ended up diverting back to the settings that Rick had laid out in the Crypto Cloaks guide. So what those settings were, were 650 watts going to the device, the fan speeds set to 55%. And in terms of heat, um, we saw that the, the kind of target heat gets nullified when you set the fan settings, but we still had the hot and dangerous temperatures and those were set to 87 and 90. Uh, and that seemed to work just fine. The caveat being, 
in my office, it's a smaller room, so it gets hotter quicker. And I found that in that smaller room, that meant that the device got hotter quicker as well. And so from time to time, I would get, I, I might have the temperature actually bump up into the, the hot temp and the fans would ramp up to 100%, cool the chips down, and then revert back to their 55%. And it would maybe do that once in a while. Whereas in a larger room, when I moved it to my living room slash kitchen kind of open space, um, because the, the, the heat kind of had more space to, to move around in, I never really had that ramping up and down. It just kind of stayed and, and let off some nice heat throughout the room. So play around. It's going to depend and vary with uh, the room that you are dealing with. And don't be afraid to play with those settings and really dial them in over the course of a few days. Okay, so we're going to get this thing situated inside the case, which uh, does come apart in pieces like this. We're going to set it in the bottom first. Uh, and we're going to start with the power supply here. I've unplugged the cord and everything. I just unplugged it from the wall. I'm going to uh, take out the Ethernet for now. We will deal with um, we'll deal with Wi-Fi momentarily after I get some stuff set up. But for now, we'll just get this thing all situated in here. All right. So the um, the power supply is going to slide obviously into this little slot here. Um, we need to have our fan above this with the, e the ethernet um, pointed towards this little divot down there. So we'll see what that looks like in a sec. Okay, so I've got the thing situated in there. The power supply was a snug fit, so you gotta kinda play with it and then push it down in there. It is flush with the bottom, which we'll see in a second. And then there's plenty of room and play with the miner um, that fits no problem. And uh, let's tip this thing and see it on its side just so you can kinda see what it looks like there. The bottom will look something like this. Uh, so the power supply comes pretty snug in there and then it'll come out the side and plug in and then uh, you can see that there's a little divot for the ethernet to come through there as well and the fan just goes flush there you can screw in and uh, affix with the fan um, you know directly to here apparently you don't need it if you don't want to I'm just gonna leave it as is because I may be pulling this thing in and out and it won't really bump around very much it's not blowing too much okay so up next we are gonna start uh, sliding on the next rings um, and just be careful not to pinch any cables or anything but it'll basically slide all the way down and clip into place and I'll just be kind of pushing some of the cables off to the side so that everything fits in nicely. We'll take a look at that when it's all done. All right, everything is all set inside. We just need to plunk on the top piece like so. And there we have it. We will plug it in just as it was before. So I'll get the ethernet cable going in the bottom and I will get the power cable going into the wall. I'll get it situated where I like it in the office and then we should be good to go. Here it is in all its glory. Plugged it in. Not a whole lot of noise, I've gotta say. Pretty quiet. It's, I think, quieter than the normal space heater that I use. So yeah, basically, you know, well, everything's running. If I get really close, you can obviously hear the fans and everything, but it's, pretty much the the same kind of sound maybe a little bit less than a regular space heater i would use and i just have it plugged into the wall and for now i've got the ethernet cable running over to my router but that's pretty much it and it just sits there whenever i don't want the heat i unplug it and then i can plug it back in and uh we should be good so of course you may not want to always have your space heater tethered to your router in your house. Your router might be in a place where the heat is not especially useful to you and you want to have this thing be mobile. So, of course, you're going to want to 
do the Wi-Fi dongle and, and have this be able to be plugged in anywhere in your home. And so that's what this next section is. Now, surprisingly, I found this, I, I ran into quite a few problems uh, that I had to kind of figure out with the Wi-Fi dongle. And a lot of it was in and around not really fully understanding networking and, and kind of what was deal, what it was being dealt with in my house. So I'm going to describe uh, in this next section the settings that I went with, but please do experiment and change some of the settings if this setup does not work specifically with you. Um, and, and it might vary for everybody, but again, you'll see in the section, the main thing is connect to your main network, not any additional networks or different uh, uh, Wi-Fi names or anything that you've created. Just like whatever, wherever the internet comes into the house, connect to that device and the Wi-Fi signal that device puts off. And that will be incredibly helpful to you as, as I learned for myself. Okay, so here's what I've got for Wi-Fi. I picked up this uh, Vonitz device, which basically allows you to uh, link it to your local Wi-Fi network and either blast off a secondary signal to kind of extend it or plug it directly into a, a device and provide internet to something that is not already Wi-Fi enabled. And so that's kind of the capacity we're gonna be using it in. So this device basically has uh, the main device itself, up on top, there is uh, a little black button, that's the reset button. There's also another little port for uh, DC power. Um, and then this is the ethernet cable that would go into the ASIC. And this side is just, it's power, so you can plug this in, uh, the USB cable for power. What I ended up doing is I bought a, an extender cable. So this is female to male. Uh, USB. So the way that works is this will plug into that cable just to extend it. And then I just bought a little power block. So this will be plugged into the wall and this will be plugged into the extender cable. So I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, basically this just gives me a little bit of extra room, uh, a little bit of extra length to be able to plug into the wall so I can move this device into whatever room I want. And then this will plug directly into the miner itself, which I have on its side right now. Um, and then pretty much we need to plug that all in together. Now, what I will say is it's best to deal with this device first and setting it up for Wi-Fi before then trying to turn on the, the miner and access it from your network as we did before. In practice, that's what I've learned. So we're gonna deal with the Vonnets thing first and setting that up, and then we will find our device, which should be under the same IP address in our local network. And just to show what it looks like when I've got it inside, I've kind of looped up this cable so that any excess is just inside the device rather than hanging out. Uh, there is the cable that'll go into the wall, and then there's the regular power cable coming from the ASIC itself. And again, just keep in mind that little black button, just have that accessible, <clears throat> because if in this process you find something weird with the Wi-Fi and you need to reset it, pretty much you're gonna hold down that button with it plugged in uh, for five or so seconds and then let go. You'll see it start flashing, uh, green for a little bit and then it'll reset the device and you'll be able to start from scratch. I had to do this a few times as I learned what settings I needed to get this set up. So just keep that in mind, that little black button, you just hold it there to reset. Okay, so I have the ethernet cable plugged in to the ASIC and I've only plugged in just the Vonnets device, okay? You wanna basically get to the point where the blue light is flashing quickly like this. That means it's kind of up and running and you're ready to access it from your local network. When you go to connect, you're looking for the Wi-Fi dongle Vonnets in your network, you're gonna to connect to that and you're going to just enter the password one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight 
unless in your documentation within the box it says something different, but it told me on the little slip of paper, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight should be the password. I can join. Now, it won't be a real internet connection. It'll say uh, internet con connection not available, but it should still connect to the device itself, at which point we can access it via the browser. So I'm now connected. I can see that it popped up and uh, I'm successfully connected. Let's get a browser window here open so we can access the device. Okay, so once you have connected to the signal being emitted from your Vonnet's device, you're gonna go to your browser and you're gonna put input one of two things. Now, one of them I had work on my phone, uh, the other one, but it did not work on my computer. Uh, and so your, your two options are you can go to vonets.cfg, so that's V-O-N-E-T-S dot C-F-G for config, um, or you can input the IP address that they provide in the little manual, which is 192.168.254.254. The second one worked for me, so the, the, the IP address worked for me here. And so it brings you to this screen. So you try both of them, whichever one gets you there, fantastic. But uh, in the absence of vonnets.cfg, the IP address should work just fine. You're gonna land on this page. You're gonna choose your uh, language and then you're gonna put in your username and password, both of which are admin, A-D-M-I-N. So we'll just put those in really quick. Once you get to the next screen, you're going to choose the wizard and this is going to scan your local network for Wi-Fi uh, wi networks to connect to and you're going to choose your network now. If you do have two different networks, so like sometimes you'll have your main Wi-Fi coming from your actual router and then you may have a secondary device. Like I know some people have, again, like um, you know, Google uh, routers and, and different Wi-Fi names. I, in practice, what I found is choosing your actual main router that seemed to work for me. So choose the main router in which the internet comes into the house and it goes to that first, whatever that signal is being emitted, that's the one you wanna to connect to. So you may need to go downstairs to your main router and get the password off that. I've also heard from other people that creating a guest network can really help with being able to connect to this device and your ASIC. Um, that did not work for me. So. Nonetheless, you're going to choose your main router and then you're going to hit next, okay? So I'm gonna click and I'm gonna hit next. Now, on this screen, I've heard different things and, and this is where we're getting down to the nitty gritty of you, you're gonna have to tinker a little bit to figure these things out um, because it can differ for everybody. Uh, effectively, what you're doing here uh, what worked for me is not touching a single thing. I didn't change anything, which means this device is also going to be emitting its own Wi-Fi signal that you could technically connect to from other devices. Uh, I would say don't use it for other devices, just let it connect to the ASIC itself and that's it. Um, so I've heard from some people that you can disable the hotspot and that actually is better to do. It did not work for me though. When I disabled the hotspot, uh, I just had problems, okay? So when in doubt, just leave this be. Don't do anything extra. All you're gonna be doing is putting in the password to your uh, Wi-Fi hotspot and then hitting apply. And that's gonna add a few options once it is applied. Just so you know, this is uh, your Wi-Fi password will be displayed in plain text. So I'm gonna put that in, I'm gonna hit apply. I'll show you in the next screen with that blocked out. Okay, so that is now all set. Uh, just so you know, it will tell you the name of the Wi-Fi, um, the Wi-Fi signal that is going to be emitted from your Vonnet's device. You can change the name of it here if you see fit. I'm just gonna leave it. I'm not gonna connect to it with anything else. Uh, you can add more Wi-Fi signals that you'd like to add. I'm not gonna do any of that. I don't wanna overcomplicate things. The one is fine. 
And then finally, there's the to connect button. I'm gonna leave this, I'm gonna hit the reboot button. Uh, actually, I'm gonna hit to connect and then I'm gonna reboot the device just to fully get this set up. And that should reboot and then the way that I knew it was working is I checked to see if actually this Wi-Fi signal was listed in my possible uh, Wi-Fi networks that I could connect to, okay? So I'm gonna hit to connect, then I'm gonna hit reboot and we'll be back. If you do hit to connect and it takes you, it doesn't give you the option to reboot, you can just go over to system settings over on the left hand side and there's a reboot button allowed uh, available for you there, which I'm doing now. Okay, so the device has now rebooted and I can see if I look at my, my networks here um, that that one that's being emitted with the 80 on the end of it is indeed coming from the Vonitz device. So that's good, I'm all set. It seems to be running just fine. Um, and what we're gonna need now is we're going to need uh, an IP scanner. So I mentioned off the top that angry IP scanner is something that you're gonna need or perhaps if you're on a Mac, this is the one that I have, LAN scan. And that's the one I'm gonna be uh, using. And we used it earlier to set up um, our, our device when it was uh, plugged in directly. Uh, but same thing here, you're gonna be searching for the IP address of your device if you're going directly to Wi-Fi. So if this is your first act connecting to it and you didn't go through the steps of, uh, of linking up just via your ethernet cable. So um, if you did previously link up with your ethernet cable, it should actually just be the exact same IP address that you used previously, but now it's just coming to you through this uh, Wi-Fi signal instead. So again, we've connected the Vonitz device. We have an IP scanner if we need it, um, just to find that signal and make sure that we can find our, our device. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna um, plug in the ASIC so that it's running. You gotta give it a minute to boot up and then we're gonna search for it in our network and try that IP address in our browser to again, access our dashboard for our miner. All right, so I was able to open up LandScan and there's a little button in the top left that just says start scan. This program will start up with uh, basically nothing showing other than the computer you're on and then when you hit start scan, it'll scan everything in your network and pop up. Now. Uh, what I noticed is um, sometimes it can be difficult to decipher what's what. Um, you know, I was looking for something labeled Vonitz, uh, but the company I guess that makes this device is called Tiger Netcom. And so that's what I found here. Um, that is your Vonitz device. If you've got the same one, it might show up as something entirely different. Uh, if you have a different Wi-Fi dongle. Anyways, it popped up, but there's actually two of them, okay? So um, your ASIC, so we can see there's two from the same company here. Your ASIC with the same IP address as you used when it was uh, plugged in with Ethernet will show up now under this device, um, but it's still accessible in the same way. You go to your browser, you plug in the IP address that's listed um, as your ASIC, um, or that's under that device and you paste it into the browser and you should be able to access the Brains OS dashboard. So let's just jump over and make sure that is true. And lo and behold, here we are on the browser, same IP address pasted in there and, uh, and we should be able to log in, no problem. But the fact that this even loaded means that, uh, yes, we do have access to Brains OS. Okay, here we are ready to go and we're on our dashboard, logged in. Everything seems to be humming away just fine. All of our settings have been retained from before when we initially set up. We're just on a, a different signal. And now our device is mobile. We can move it to wherever we see fit. Um, just a little note here, uh, the uh, settings, I ended up going with the 55% at 650 watts is what I'm working with now. Uh, the heat settings are still the same as before with 87 and 90 as kind of my hot and dangerous temperatures. But other than that, everything is all set, ready to go. And uh, hey, I've got a mobile heater 
for my home, that's mining Bitcoin. All right, so my final thoughts here in around uh, building and using this space heating miner is number one, it, again, a fantastic learning opportunity for a very low price point. You can start mining Bitcoin and learning what that even is and what the processes involved are. You can get hands on with an ASIC. You can you know, have a fun project to do in the first place, which I don't know about you guys, but I love doing this kind of stuff. And on top of that, you get a, a second order effect where you're actually taking what was waste. In this case, you were using, you know, in, in my case, I was using more energy on a device that did the same thing, actually less, um, so I was using a space heater that was you know, 1500 watts and I was using that to, to heat parts of my home anyways. What I've done is I've reduced the consumption of electricity and I'm further getting reimbursed some of the electricity cost while also heating. So um, this to me is is an exciting development where and, and, and it's it built into the incentive structures of Bitcoin, proof of work, mining, all of that, where people are looking for waste and they're looking to capitalize on waste. And so I've, you know, people are, are finding ways to use that waste heat from Bitcoin mining and put it to work. And in this instance, it's kind of like this this inverse where it's something I was doing anyways. I actually figured out, well, I didn't figure out, but like people have figured out, oh, you can actually use less energy and get reimbursed part of the cost of the electricity you're already using and still do the thing you were trying to do, which is heat a room in your home. Um, we're seeing more stuff like this. We're seeing it used for uh, heating garages, for heating hot tubs and uh, hot water tanks in homes, greenhouses, things like that. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing more of this where uh, you're, you're getting reimbursed for energy that you are going to use anyways. Um, it's no longer going to waste and you're powering a censorship resistant uh, global economy in the meantime which is that's that's pretty powerful if you're if your hot water heater can ensure censorship res, uh, resistant transactions for the globe that's pretty badass so anyways that that's kind of my final thoughts i will say again this is all very early stages so there's a lot of tinkering to be done there's a lot of experimentation to be done i played around with this and i'm still in the midst of kind of fine tuning where i wanted to be and how i want it to work there were plenty of things where i said well that okay the guide was different from what i needed the screws i needed to tinker around with expect to problem solve expect to try different things out expect it not to be perfect right out the gate and tune it to your needs um if you come in with that mentality then then you'll be doing fine the other thing i'll note and I'll show it really quick too in the final thoughts here is uh from time to time I would if I relocate the device sometimes it will automatically go to the fan settings that I wanted and other times it wouldn't pick up the fan speed and so I just had to quickly hit the save and apply button and so what I mean is I would plug it in and the fans would initially turn on at 100% and they would just kind of keep going at that rate. And I go, oh, okay, what the hell's going on? So what I had to do, I'll show you really quick here. On the dashboard, it's in my living room right now running, by the way. Uh, on the dashboard, what this would show up as is there all the fan monitors would just be empty. It wouldn't show anything, but they're running at full speed. And so what I would have to do is just go to configuration. Oh, Got to log in again. So I would just go to configuration up top. I'd go to performance uh, and I would just go down and I'd hit the save and apply button here. And then I'd go to temperature and fans and I'd hit the save and apply button there. And it seemed to 
take a second and then all of a sudden you'd see all this data start to come in and then eventually as soon as you see the chip temperature populate then uh the fans which would now register 100 would drop down to the appropriate 55 percent so if you find that plugging it in in different places has the fans going full bore right out the gate just log on to to uh, your brains os uh, interface here and just go into your configuration and just hit save and apply here and save and apply here and that should do the trick that's what did it for me um, anyways <laughs> i guess that just further reiterates my point of this is a learning process um, and jump into the Telegram group for Brains OS as well. Uh, you can go to their website and you'll be able to find it there. And they will be more than help, happy to help you on your journey as well. I was asking questions in there too. Yeah, just take it as an all around learning activity and uh, you should have a lot of fun with it. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, please do like, subscribe, share. All those things help a ton. They help get this content in front of more eyeballs. So if you find it valuable, then share it around and uh, we'll get more people heating their homes with ASICs. Uh, if you want to help out the show, you can do a few things. Uh, you can also hit up the previously mentioned sponsors down below. Hoddle Hoddle, CoinKite, Nunchuck, and Start9. You can hit up my website, btcsessions.ca. There you'll find a ton of different stuff, resources for people just getting started and everything. You can also book me for one-on-one -on -one sessions. So if the free tutorials on YouTube aren't quite enough, you need some extra hand-holding, you can hit me up for uh, direct one-on-one, -on -one, basically walk you through whatever you need. You can also check out uh, over on the far right of my website, btcsessions.ca, there's in-person workshops. So coming up, I've got one in Miami uh, doing a cold card deep dive and all kinds of great stuff. I'll be traveling around, so there's always uh, usually some sort of a workshop if I'm gonna be traveling and going to uh, different conferences and so on and so forth, and I'm there, I'll probably be running one. Anyways, you can check that out. Again, check out the website. And finally, if you really liked what you saw, you can always drop me a Bitcoin tip at my strike page. So you don't need strike to do it. You just head over to strike.me slash BTC sessions, type in any amount you want, you hit the tip button and you will be greeted with a lightning invoice. Or if you prefer, tap the arrow to the right, you'll see a regular Bitcoin Q our code. With that, I am out. Have yourselves a wonderful day or evening. See you guys next time for your daily session. Hold all the Bitcoin.